It's time for the Nappy Time Lectures with the Amateur Sommelier. Sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the Amateur Sommelier. And this is kind of building on last week's wine lecture that I presented where... Briefly, we talked about using different yeast strains in regards to climate change for wine fermentation and all that related topics. But this is specifically going to be about wine yeasts. And I would dare say this is not even going to be a wine lecture. This is a rabbit hole that when I did research for this very much so was a lot deeper and took a lot more source material than I ever wanted to actually do. But I dove down this rabbit hole. Well, I'll show you what the reason is, but first we have to go over the objectives. We have to identify the main yeast species in winemaking, um, explain the advantages of what's called natural fermentation, Discover the yeast strains responsible for wine spoilage, and name one fungal species known to affect humans. Why about that last one? This is the one reason why I wanted to go on this insane rabbit hole journey. It is probably one of the most disgustingly perverse questions a scientist or anyone in general would ever ask in the history of literally ever. This is the time where I'm going to warn you, you might want to have a paper barf bag nearby. Because the question is, can I take a terminally ill patient, a fungal infection? Now this is budding yeast over here. There could also be hyphal yeast, there could be mildew mold, lots of other things we'll get into. But can I take this fungal species isolate it from a terminally ill patient culture and subculture the fungus add in grape must i understand this looks a lot like grape juice but entertain me and make wine now most people's reaction understandably so i will not blame you for this should be, that is absolutely disgusting, and what on earth is wrong with you? Besides the fact that I have a very sick mind, there is a thought process to this. There is a rabbit hole to this insanity. So, what really has to breed itself out of whatever happens in my brain, which, you know, besides getting therapy, which is a whole different can of worms and a totally different... Topic of discussion. What yeast is used for winemaking? It's actually Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which most of you will know is bread yeast. But there are actually different strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. There's actually a lot of them. A lot more than I ever wanted to know. Strangely and sadly enough. So, the power of our Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It is a unicellular fungus. It produces ethanol and other two carbon compounds via pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule, even under aerobic conditions. This is called the Crabtree effect. The reason it does this is to eliminate competition from other microorganisms to survive by itself. It doesn't like that yeast strain over there. Well, I'm just going to make the entire environment more, basically, alcoholic. There's more ethanol concentration in the area. You can't survive in this higher ethanol concentration, but I can. So I'm just going to produce a bunch of ethanol, and then you're going to go, bop, boop, beep. Now, of course, this is strain dependent, as there are lots of strains, but it's not entirely the whole story here. There are other yeast strains that can also produce ethanol in such concentrations. 
as you see uh, among them, Cloyveromyces canina pichia. And there's this phenomenon. It's called wild yeast fermentation, which is letting natural occurring yeast in the environment, in the winery, in the vineyard, ferment the grapes, the grape must, rather, rather than these commercialized uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae strains, you know, you have the bags of bread yeast that are like, hey, you can use this and make bread. Woo! It, it's more wild in nature as opposed to the commercialized little baggies we all love to use. Now, Chronics, particularly, I think, when I was researching this, the critics were from France, and we all know the French are up and about on their wines, and, you know, yes, I will call you out on that, my French viewing audience, however many you may be, to say that wild yeast fermentation creates lower quality wines with lower alcohol strength. And there is some truth to this, actually. Natural vineyard yeast strains... Once you get around 10% ethanol concentration, most of those other wild yeast strains basically die off. The concentration of the ethanol, the alcohol, is too much for them to survive. But there are strains, of course, of our dear friend Saccharomyces cerevisiae still kicking, and they're like, ooh. ooh. It's time to make a Cabernet Sauvignon, as opposed to our natural vineyard yeast strains that, at 10%, you're probably looking at, I think, Riesling's is probably the strongest you can get. You might be able to get away with a weak rosé. You're not getting some of those Bordeaux-style reds, Pinot Noir. You could probably get away with a lot of sweet wines, though. You really could. Sweet wines, they're usually somewhere between 5 and 8%. Yeah, that's kind of a ballpark as far as alcohol concentration goes. So, why would you then do natural yeast fermentation if you have a limit of scope and practicability? It's the last one that actually is getting more of the attention in the wine industry. It's exciting and incredibly unpredictable. And at the top, you can produce a lot of unique wines. Because apparently, as it turns out, the wild yeast strains, even in different blocks of the same vineyard property, are different. So you're having a lot of... A variety as far as yeast strains go in nature on the same property no less just literally letting nature take its course you do a lot of different things with flavor acidity tannin I can literally keep going that will lead to greater mouthfeel on the palate more full-bodied wines but you have to be very careful with fermentation. It's going to take longer. You have to very much so keep an eye, making sure the yeast strains are still alive there. You're not just going right to the Saccharomyces. Mainly because the different yeasts, they ferment differently, obviously, because there's so many strains of them and their enzymatic pathways and can release different aromatic compounds during fermentation that would normally be detected. Now, I did not go through all of these possible yeasts with all of these enzymes, mainly because this is going to be deep enough a rabbit hole as it is. Going into the biochemistry roots and saying, oh, here's this enzyme for this yeast strain, and oh, we're going to go into zero, first, even second order kinetics, and all of these coefficients and going into all that biochemistry is not practical for this wine lecture rabbit hole. That is frankly insane, even for me. So we're not unfortunately going to do that for all of my biochemistry enthusiasts. I will apologize, but I, I think you'll thank me later. 
We have to next go to the yeasts that cause wine spoilage. Because they do exist. And so we'll start with, to me, it looks like a dermatophyte. It is a hyphal yeast. As you can see on the left, this electron microscope photo. It's called Decara bruxellensis. Now, the problem with Decara here is what's called smoky or wet horse aromas. My sister knows a lot more about the horse aromas, the wet horse aroma. So I don't know what it smells like. Smoky, I, that's kind of close to my ballpark. But these aromas are caused by carbonyl and volatile phenol groups. Which is awful for wine. But apparently, in low amounts granted, it's very practical in lambic beer. No idea what that is. Sourdough bread. Not a fan. Kombucha tea which I do need to try at some point, and ale, which I don't know if it's the Belgian ale, ale in general, wasn't really able to expand on that. But the activity of the enzyme for Decaro, which is beta-glucosidase, releases these desirable phenolic compounds, which are volatile and most likely carbonyl, in low amounts, great in the above, in wine, we don't want it. We're good. We're quite fine. See me for just one second. A lot of talking. Next one is so it's Saccharomycoides ludwigii. It doesn't really look like a budding yeast, but it's not really. A hyphal yeast. You can see on the electronic microscope. It looks like there's spores that are encapsulated or forming. Uh, possibly a mold. Maybe is it a dermatophyte? Not 100% sure. What we do know, in quotes, is that it is the winemaker's nightmare. This literal bug, which is a yeast, not an actual bug, calm down grows in high ethanol concentration as well as high SO2 environments. You guys know sulfur dioxide, sulfites, are used to preserve wine. This can survive the sulfite environment. It can survive the high ethanol concentrations. This thing is a menace to society and wine as we know it. And the reason why is it produces high amounts of acetoin, ethyl acetate, or acetic acid, which are undesirable, because for those of us in the know, especially acetic acid, it's this cool thing called vinegar. Do you want to drink straight vinegar? Well, I mean, I kind of quote drink it with my salads, but I'm going to be honest with you, drinking it full straight, not really. Although some people say that drinking apple cider vinegar i don't even think they do it straight i think they do a dilution can help with weight loss yeah it doesn't really help with somebody who has acid reflux I just, no although there are some people that are older in my family that will actually drink straight vinegar mom i'm bloody calling you out i can't believe you did that anyway <sighs> So, how do we get rid of this absolute monstrosity from the wine? Three methods. The chemical, which, you know, it's just a bad rap, but it does exist. Dimethyl dicarbonate, or ketosan, to take care of our Ludwigii. There's the biologic method, which is, quote, called the killer yeasts. Which you should know from the previous slide, we have some of the other ethanol producing yeasts. So, Pitya, Cliveromyces. There's also, how do I pronounce this? Mechnicoia. This is what I'm going to go with. Let me know in the comments if I just absolutely butchered that and how to do it correctly, because I really don't know. And then the physical methods, 
You can use pulsed electric fields. There's some kind of a current that goes through and kills them off. It just messes with their, um, I guess these walls here. I don't even show their capsids. I then get to the spores and they just go, ah! Or gamma radiation. Because, yes, I like to worry about gamma radiation in my wine because, you know... <laughs> Especially in their current environment right now. I just need to worry about more radiation. <laughs> yeah, terrible timing for this one. <clears throat> now, to be fair to Ludwigii, there is recent research that some strains will release more aromatic compounds, which actually improves the aroma in white wines. Whites, not reds. You'll just lighten the color up in the reds. Not good. Whites. Keep it there. It also, interestingly, can help reduce alcohol content in wine when mixing cultures with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Let's go back to our climate change wine lecture. You have over overripened grapes. You add our cerevisiae friend. There's way too much sugar. From the grapes, because they're overripe, that makes too much alcohol. Apparently, Ludwigii comes in, reduces the alcohol content. It's mixed. How? I don't really know. I would assume it's probably something to do with competition, as we said earlier. Saccharomyces cerevisiae tries to make a higher ethno-concentrated environment to kill off all of the other fungi, yeast strains, and bacteria. Well, Saccharomycoids Ludwigii can basically play game, if you will, with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And be like, ha, I'm still alive. Uh. Something of that nature. I know, that was a very weird analogy. So, going into further wine fermentation... It can help release more polysaccharides, which leads to a more full body feeling, sweetness, protein stability, and maintaining antioxidant capacity, which those of us who want a glass of wine a day for the resveratrol, blood circulation, heart health, are like, ooh, we want antioxidants. We'd also like something full bodied, but also be sweet with protein stability. It's great. And, of course, it can be used with that sweetness to ferment other beverages, like fruit wines. <laughs> Gonna be honest, though, I'm not the biggest fan of fruit wines. It's just, it's too sweet for me. But for those of you who like fruit wines, yeah, there might actually be some uh, Saccharomyces Ludwigii in there. Would not recommend trying to actually go analyze your bottle of fruit wine to find them, though. Next one, next strain we're going to talk about is Zygosaccharomyces rootsii. Now, you look at the electron microscope picture there. It looks like there's a capsule. See that halo on the outer circle, and then it actually reveals the uh, bud of yeast there. It looks to be mostly, well, there's quite a few triplicates. There's a whole... Crazy ring thing going on over there. A couple of uh, two buds, a single there. Very interesting. So, this monstrosity in and of itself is more than a wine spoiler. It can also spoil fruit drinks, sodas, salad dressings, and so much more. But, interestingly enough... It can cause re-fermentation and more CO2 production and turbidity, particularly in the sweet wines, which is how they spoil. But with that re-fermentation process, it can be used to ferment low-alcohol beer. So you're looking at something like I was doing where I'm looking for non-alcoholic beer or very low alcohol concentration, this is where Zygosaccharomyces rucii comes in. 
It's also used to make the salted condiments, such as soy sauce, miso paste, even balsamic vinegar. There's one for you. And it can only be controlled by sanitation practices, which hypochlorite we know as bleach. There's also paracetic acid. But yeah, when this thing gets into something, it has fun. And we don't want it to have fun. Let me just say, but wait a minute. Which of these yeast species actually infects patients? Are they even on this list? Well, that goes to our next slide. Turns out, only one of them is on this list for notable human fungal pathogens. It's actually Canada. But there's also, as you can see, quite a bit more on here. You guys from the news have heard more about coccidioides, histoplasma, plasmomyces. Um, hospitals, we know more. Aspergillus, we do see quite a bit of Canada. Cryptococcus, Neocystis. And there's also mucormycetes. So the epic conclusion of that entire exercise. It's not very feasible currently to use other yeast strains to ferment grape must into wine. There is natural fermentation, but it's going to take longer. It's harder to scale up. It's more so kind of a local one vineyard winery does it. You can't really scale it to some of the bigger operation brands like in California that are producing like tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of bottles of wine every year. So, for me, unfortunately, it appears unlikely that using a fungal pathogen from a patient could be used to make wine. Which all of you are like, thank freaking goodness. We don't have to deal with that. Or some person just going on some kind of crazy tangent to actually attempt this mad dog experiment. And that would be great. Except I'm just going to flip the reverse into some kind of multiverse nonsense. And ask ourselves the question, what if I could use a human fungal pathogen to make wine? What if it was possible? I'm going to take the rest of this presentation to go into how exactly my thought process, at least, would work. Now, before I begin that insanity, am I trained to do microbiology? By my certification, yes. Part of my certification process did involve taking microbiology courses, labs, rotation. Could I find my way around a microbiology lab? I could. Do you want me in a microbiology lab? No. Good freaking grief, no. Chemistry, fantastic. Hematology, excellent. Microbiology and immunohematology, which is what you guys would know as blood banking, don't put me anywhere near there. Microbiology, mainly because, can I do the lab work? Yes. Do I understand kind of a lecture portion about how antimicrobials and how stuff grows and all this other stuff works? That's where by the wayside just dies apart. Immunohematology, blood banking is the opposite. Do I understand the concepts that are presented in a lecture to say, hey, this is how stuff works? Yes, I understand that portion. Putting that into practice in a lab is probably the greatest disaster on the entire planet. I get what's being presented and taught to me. Actually putting it to practical use is an absolute behemoth that which, yeah, it just don't work. And yes, I will completely out myself that. I do understand that being a, quote, jack-of-all-trades is only so far. I am very much a master of none. Although, 
you know, we, we can we can debate depending on level of knowledge. But anyway, let's let's start. Let's say I am some crazy psycho brilliant microbiologist in this multiverse new universe thing. Step one. Let's isolate the fungal pathogen. Let's get a patient specimen. Urine will be the most easiest to get. Why? It's already a waste product. It's already naturally occurring. Just literally catheter or however you want to collect the urine. As long as it's a clean catch. Please make it a clean catch for the love of God. Clean catch being your first amount of urine, about a mil, is discarded. Then you collect and then... The last mill should be discarded. That is the freest from contamination, um, such as skin bacteria. Um, if you have any um, powder in that area for dryness or antifungal, antibacterial, you want to make sure those crystals, they will show up on the urine if not collected properly. So those will show up. Now, if it's not in the urine, let's say if it's a tissue or even in the stool, first of all, stool pathogen processing is an awful nightmare. You have to isolate out all the bacteria any other fungal strains, possibly viruses. I mean, it, it's just disgusting. Just for that alone. Although the other portion is, it absolutely smells awful. If you've ever been around someone who unfortunately is infected with C. diff, just remember that awful smell, and then realize why stool pathogen processing from there is just... Ugh. God, I'm going to get sick already talking about it. <clears throat> so let's go with urine. Urine is what we started with. We're going to keep going. And I don't know tissue processing a whole hell of a lot. That is uh, histology and yeah. Not going to go there. So let's take our urine. Let's centrifuge an aliquot. As I like to tell all of the students I work with, or new trainees, Aliquotel. Aliquot's a lot easier, I understand. Let's isolate the urine elements, which, you know, among a lot of other things, we mainly focus on RBCs, WCCs, bacteria, fungus, epithelial cells. There's also uh, protein casts from the kidneys, mucus. Other crystal elements. And then let's culture that. Now the most common media for fungal culture that I know of back in my day is called sob auger. This basically will kill off most of the bacteria and just leave the fungal elements. There's just one small problem with using sob auger. It's difficult to scale because it's literally a circular plate. And in order to do the subculturing to keep the pathogen alive and isolate it, you're going to need a lot of plates. And we're not talking like... I think when we got them in, I was doing a microbiology rotation, there was like a 10 and a sleeve pack. You're going to need at least a pack. You're probably going to need an entire shipment, which is three or four sleeves. So that's like between 30 and 40 plates. And, of course, the scaling up to make it more commercial, like our bread yeast bags from earlier, is... Yeah. Not really sure if that's totally practical... If it can be commercialized. And two other things you got to worry about. Uh, what happens if the incubator fails? So, you know, incubator is a machine. You know, it keeps 
the um, bacteria and the yeast that are growing on those plates at usually 37 degrees Celsius. I'm pretty sure it's 37 that most are set at. You want it to be around between 36 and 38. You don't want to go too much lower because then you're inhibiting growth. You go higher, you're going to start killing off everything and try to melt your media for culturing. And don't try to do that. I mean, unless you want to make a mess of everything. I mean, go for it. But yeah, I don't want to do that. And then the other thing that happens, you know, let's say you lose the culture, or it dies off or something. What happens when the patient inevitably passes? Because, you know, fungal infections are really hard to kill. Everyone's worried about antimicrobial resistance. And that is an issue. That's, of course, this is totally a different tangent, but antimicrobial usage resistance is a major problem. Antifungals are actually worse. And it's not for a resistance issue. It's that pathogenic yeast those cells are very similar to how human cells are they're both eukaryotic i believe is the pronoun correct pronunciation term weird usage so basically when you use an antifungal you're not only killing the yeast you're also killing the human cells which makes treatment very difficult and let's say that the fungus actually is resistant to that fungus. So, or it has fungal resistance. So you're not only not really killing off the fungus as well, but you're killing off the human cells as well. If you have to use a higher concentration or go to something else or use stuff in tandem, you're killing more and more human cells. The fungus is very slowly dying. It can still proliferate and spread to other organs and you, you just you really got a mess on your hands fungal infections it, it ain't fun sorry that was, that was a heck of a tangent there uh next step now is the fermentation process different yeast strains are used for different wines so you now have to pair up okay what can i do with yeast yeast strain that i have what can i go with this pathogenic fungus, what wine is going to be most suited to make this? The best wine I can make. Do I want to go fruit wine? Can I go with a semi-sweet? Can I go full bore Bordeaux? Or even port? Yeah, so you got to... That's going to take research. That obviously takes time. The next thing you're going to want to do is have the grape must quickly available to start fermentation. Once you get the subcultures, the isolates that you want, you really don't want them incubating any more excuse me, than you have to. You want to actually start the process right away because then you have to keep your isolates alive. If that's delayed, you have to subculture to keep them alive. Some cultures really only last probably at most three days. And I would say the best to use them by is like two. So, I mean, you, you're you really, you're going through plates like it's no one's business. It, it's kind of crazy. And then after that, you have to carefully monitor the fermentation process. You know, you got to make sure the yeast won't just completely die off once the alcohol concentration reaches 5 to 10%. You got to make sure they stay alive. You got to make sure that other yeast species don't contaminate and interfere because then you don't know what's actually doing the fermentation process. If you somehow sneak in some CeraVCI and then it just jacks up the entire fermentation process, you want to keep the pathogenic fungus being the one to do all the work. And that just is a whole bunch of research, a lot of other things. And on top of that, I mean, could you add Saccharomyces cerevisiae to your pathogenic yeast and make new unique wines characteristics, kind of like wild yeast? I mean, who knows? I mean, that's, that's a whole other thing of research that needs to get pursued. 
I mean, the resources it's going to require just... It, it, it is, frankly, well beyond at least my personal capacity. It truly really is. So now the actual conclusion. Because this has been going on. Wow. <laughs> oh, these wine lectures. These are these are long. These are some long ones. I apologize. But, uh, yeah. They're a lot longer than I expected. There's probably no shot of this happening anytime soon. There are a lot of other medical and ethical questions that need to be asked. Should we allow a terminally ill patient with a fungal infection to stay alive this long just so we can harvest, you know, the actual pathogenic yeast to actually do this insane experiment, you know? We need to be treating the patient. Are they on hospice, you know? You got to get a bunch of forms, documentation uh, from the patient to actually go through with this as well as research medical boards. I'm sure the government's somewhere involved. I think the FDA is also involved too somehow. Because I think they do something with research. I can't remember. There, there's there's a lot of things you got to go through. So this this literally is a madman's thought process and dreams and just kind of exploring that and. If you did enjoy, if you made it this far, I mean, uh, I legitimately applaud you. I truly do. I I, I applaud you because this, this, you, you'll realize it really is a deep rabbit hole. There's a lot of things you got to worry about. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe. You know, thank you so much for watching. Can this be done in the future? Possibly. And the other question really is, should it be done? I mean, <laughs> again, serious medical and ethical questions that need to be asked and answered. Truthfully. And, of course, to end, look at all the source material I had to pull this off. That's a lot. I think there's nine sources. So, yes. I hope to see you guys on the next wine lecture. Until then, have a great evening, everybody.